Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, Chapter 9, Text 8, Translation, and many others like Shukadev Goswami and other purified souls, Kashyapa and Angiras and others, all accompanied by their respective disciples, arrived there. Purport. Shukadev Goswami, Brahmarat, the famous son and disciple of Shivyasadev, who taught him first the Mahabharat and then Srimad Bhagavatam. Shukadev Goswami recited 1,400,000 verses of the Mahabharat in the councils of the Gandharvas, Yakshas and Rakshasas and he recited Srimad Bhagavatam for the first time in the presence of Maharaj Parikshit. He thoroughly studied all the Vedic literatures from his great father. Thus he was a completely purified soul by dint of his extensive knowledge in the principles of religion. From Mahabharat, Sabha Parva, it is understood that he was also present in the royal assembly of Maharaj Yudhishthir and at the fasting of Maharaj Parikshit. As a bona fide disciple of Sri he inquired from his father very extensively about religious principles and spiritual values. And his great father also satisfied him by teaching him the yoga system by which one can attain the spiritual kingdom, the difference between fruitive work and empiric knowledge, the ways and means of attaining spiritual realization, the four ashrams, namely the student life, the householder's life, the retired life, and the renounced life, the sublime position of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the process of seeing Him eye to eye, the bona fide candidate, for receiving knowledge, the consideration of the five elements, the unique position of intelligence, the consciousness of the material nature and the living entity, the symptoms of the self-realized soul, the working principles of the material body, the symptoms of the influential modes of nature, the tree of perpetual desire and psychic activities. Sometimes he went to the sun planet with the permission of his father and Naradaji. Descriptions of his travel in space are given in the Shanti Parava of the Mahabharata. At last he attained the transcendental realm. He is known by different names like Aranaya, Arane Sutta, Vyasaki, and Vyasatmaja. Kashyapa, one of the Prajapatis, the son of Marichi, and one of the sons in law of Prajapati Daksha. He is the father of the gigantic bird Garuda, who was given elephants and tortoises as eatables. He married 13 daughters of Prajapati Daksha, and their names are Aditi, Diti, Danu, Kashtha, Arishta, Surasa, Ila, Muni, Krodhavasha, Tamra, Surabhi, Sarama, and Timi. He begot many children, both demigods and demons, by those wives. From his first wife, Aditi, all the twelve Adityas were born. One of them is Vamana, the incarnation of Godhead. This great sage, Kasyapa, was also present at the time of Arjuna's birth. He received a presentation of the whole world from Parashuram, and later on he asked Parashuram to go out of the world. His other name is Arishtanemi. He lives on the northern side of the universe. Angirasa, he is the son of Maharsh, Maharashi, Angira, and is known as Brihaspati, the priest of the demigods. It is said that Dronacharya was his partial incarnation. Shukracharya was the spiritual master of the demons, and Brihaspati challenged him. His son is Kacha, and he delivered the fire, fire weapon, <clears throat> first to Bharadvaj Muni. He begot six sons like the fire god, by his wife Chandramasi, one of the reputed stars. He could travel in space and therefore he could present himself even in the planets of Brahmaloka and Indraloka. He advised the king of heaven, Indra, about conquering the demons. Once he cursed Indra, who thus had to become a hog on the earth and was unwilling to return to heaven. Such is the power of the attraction of the illusory energy. Even a hog does not wish to part with its earthly possessions in exchange for a heavenly kingdom. He was the religious preceptor of the natives of different planets. In several purports in this first canton 
in, in his presentation of the first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, Srila Prabhupada has given many biographies of the personages listed there, as he does here. He's given many biographies of Shukadev Goswami, Kashapa Prajapati, and Angiras Brihaspati. And some of their mini biography means the the notable points by which they they are even today famous have been mentioned in synopsis. So uh, different points are given here. Brihaspati, for instance, and being the advisor of King Indra, sometimes cursing Maharaj Indra, Shukdev Goswami could travel in space. So these are all notable features. Ordinary people can't travel in space. Ordinary people don't have the uh, position to give advice to Maharaj Indra. Ordinary people are not the, cannot be the priest of the demigod. So these are extraordinary people who are being described here. They're extraordinary by their spiritual knowledge. It's mentioned here that they arrived in the company of their disciples. They're means that they have spiritual knowledge, realize knowledge, that knowledge is, that they have that knowledge is manifest in their lives. Vairagya vidya. There is no spiritual knowledge without vairagya, detachment from this world. Spiritual knowledge means to understand the difference between spirit and matter. So if one, if one actually has that knowledge, then he must be detached from material enjoyment. So vi actual vairagya or non-attack detachment, that is a symptom of spiritual knowledge. And the great personages mentioned here manifestly had this knowledge and renunciation and thus they attracted many students, disciples. Actually there's different words, student we say. Prabhupada sometimes used to say my students. That is one term. The word for or words for student are vidyarti. Those who are desirous, those whose purpose is to attain knowledge. Another word is chatra, which means those who are sheltered as if under a chatra umbrella. They're under the shelter of the guru. And shishya means <coughs> disciple, one who is under discipline. So the disciples would voluntarily accept the discipline of the Guru in order to attain from him the knowledge by which he is wealthy. These personages, Shukadeva Goswami is known for having nothing not even cloth to cover his body. But he was so wealthy, so wealthy that even so many other great personages, including Vyasadeva, his father and guru, and Narad Muni, the guru of his guru, they also liked to hear from him. He was so wealthy. Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur expressed 
a, a, a similar realization he had when he approached his guru. He generally referred to, or he often referred to his two gurus, Srila Bhakti and Thakur, who, as his apparent father, gave him so much spiritual knowledge and sent him for training in Sanskrit and related and general education. And later sent him for initiation to Srila Gorki Shardas Babaji Maharaj. Now, at this time, Srila Bhaktisthan Saraswati Thako was already well known as a scholar, of, known to be of highly aristocratic background, impeccable, good character, moral, truthful, in all ways could be considered the ideal disciple. And indeed, many so-called gurus were anxious to have him as their disciple to increase their own prestige. A disciple should attempt to increase the prestige, not his own prestige, but by his activities increase the prestige of his guru. Because rabbits don't give birth to lions. If the disciple is of noteworthy caliber and character, then it's we understood that he has received this gift from his guru. So Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur, so many, the young Siddhanta Saraswati, so many gurus were anxious to have him as their disciple. They were canvassing him. Actually, the disciples should approach the guru, but they were, he was going around the other way. You, you come, you come be my disciple. Trying to seduce him like this. But he was the chatra. He was sheltered by Srila Bhakti Nautaku. Thakur. He warned, don't get caught in these people's traps. But he sent him to Gorky Shodas Babaji Maharaj, who rejected him. <laughs> who appeared to be like a, from external vision, appeared to be like a somewhat crazy fellow. He would also often go naked. Or maybe sometimes covered him. He'd take some torn cloth from some body that had been sent for burning, but they didn't. Means that the poor people or the beggars, the municipal corporation takes out their body and burns when they die. So if, if someone from a respectable family, is, if, if, the, if their body is burned, then someone will say, stay and see it gets burned properly. But with the beggars, no one cares. Just set it alight and leave it. And so it may not burn properly and may become food for the, for the dogs and the crows and the vultures. But who cares anyway? No one cares. So that cloth from that body, which is the, the most contaminated thing, sometimes Gorky Shaw does, but he might take some of that to cover his body. And he rejected Siddhan says, no, he, he said that I, I couldn't serve my own guru properly, so how can I accept any disciple? How can I initiate you? So he went again and he, he begged that you please. He was shocked. I thought, surely he should accept me. Then again he went and asked that, will you please give me an issue? He said, all right, I'll ask Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. You come again after some days. So again, I came up to Sunday and said, well, what did Mahaprabhu say? He said, I forgot to ask. <laughs> he showed total indifference to him. He didn't care. Just don't bother me, you know. All this, don't bother me coming and then you'll disturb me in so many ways. I had some disciple before, but he cheated me and went away. I don't want any more disciples. So, Bhaktisdhan Sarasar Thakur said that when I when I, all the things in me that I thought were so valuable, my aristocracy, my learning, my morality, my good behavior, 
when all these things which I thought were very valuable and I saw that my Guru Dave, he didn't consider them in the slightest bit important, then I could understand what wealth he had when he considered all these things useless. And then I realized that I had no choice but to fully surrender unto him to gain that wealth which my learning, my aristocracy, my good behavior, my reputation, none of these were sufficient to gain the wealth which this apparent beggar or madman had within him. So then he said that Karuna na hoile kandia kandia prana rakibho that if you don't show your mercy to me then weeping and weeping I shall not be able to sustain my life. Because Bhaktisthan Sarasvara Thakur, in the, he was, in the words of, in the language given by Srila Bhaktisthan Thakur, Shargra, he one who was seeking for the essence. So he was already a learned scholar, upholding the Vedic principles in the, in the line of astrology, he was a revolutionary reformer in the line of astrology before he came to Krishna consciousness and was he was getting on the case of all the other astrologers that nowadays you're you're just interested in expanding the size of your stomach and not in studying the Shastras and accepting all Western propositions instead of seeing the wealth that we actually have. So he was he was in the Vedic line, of course it was not, not that he was not in the Bhakti line, but he was specializing in the line of astrology, astronomy, mathematics. But then later he left that for the highest treasure which this person who had nothing of this world possessed. That was the sign of his actual wealth. That he had no desire for anything in this world. It showed, just showing that nothing of this world could attract him. He had he was actually fixed in the in the higher taste of Krishna consciousness. Not even prestige, nothing. He didn't this that many people may desire to be known as a saint, but he wasn't interested in that. So he was on the topmost platform of realization. Not very easy to be a disciple of. Srila <laughs> Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasar Thakur also. Not very easy to be a disciple of. I don't know how many of us could qualify to be his disciple. Prabhupada said that I'm 80% more lenient than my Guru Maharaj. And to be a disciple of Kashyap, Prihaspati, Shukadev Goswami, probably you have to be a, by our estimation, you probably have to be a pure devotee before you can even, I mean, they wouldn't even let you come close to him. Just like this temple here, you enter through the front door and you go around and you see the deities facing the other way. Did you ever see that in any other temple? That's here because the rule was there that the the temple should not be entered into by lower caste people, less qualified people. So the story is that who is that? Kanakdas, who's local here? Kanakdas, yes. He's not allowed in the temple. So he would come and through some hole in the wall which is still there. They just made the Gopuram there. You can he would look through and Look at the temple, and then Krishna turned around. That's why he's not facing that. that. He's facing away from the entrance because Krishna turned around to see him. So that rule was there. One had to be very qualified even to be a disciple. So much qualification one has to be. Generally, one would have to be of a good family. One would have to be self-controlled before you can be a disciple. Because if one is to accept the discipline of the guru, 
then he must have some internal self-discipline. Otherwise, how can one accept the di- external discipline if there's no internal discipline? He must, he must be ready for that, to accept that. He must be situated in the mode of goodness, clean, cultured, well-behaved. Traditionally, the disciples, they would have their cultural training at home first, then go to Guru. Prabhupada taught everything, how to pass stool. That's not usually disciples, gurus don't usually teach that, but then in the Western countries the idea is you pass, you smear it all around your backside with some paper, (laughs) put your clothes back on and maybe wash your hands and then get back to life as it is. So it sounds ridiculous, we're laughing now, but that's what we used to do, at least those of us coming from the Western countries. And in India that's what they're going to start doing because they're doing everything Western, And so, to become high class, they're going to have to start smearing their backsides with paper and not taking bath after passing stool to become fully westernized and then make sure their dog licks them when they come out of the toilet just to make themselves completely westernized. So, traditionally this was not taught by the the guru who is giving spiritual knowledge and cultural (coughs) training is given at home. All these different things. Just bow down when you see a superior. One should bow down. One should not speak out of turn in the, how to, in the presence of a superior. All these things. First of all, they were taught. So it's like primary, what do they call that? Kindergarten training. Now, nowadays, that's considered highly cultured if someone is at least among the followers of the Vedic tradition, which is the actual culture, if someone, they know how to respect elders and they know not to walk in, in between people when they're talking and all these details, of, that's considered high, highly cultured. Although actually this was taught to the young children before they went for school training. School training means... Brahmachari Guru Kule Vasandanta Guru Hitan Dasavan Acharan Nicho Guru Suhrida Sohridam So that Sudrida Sohridam. The Brahmacharis they were sent to the Guru Kul, they would live there, not day school. <laughs> and they would live there, the training is to act only for the pleasure of the Guru. Whatever he wants you to do, you act for his benefit. Understanding that he is a selfless person. And Acharan Dasam, just like a menial servant, with an attitude of firm friendship to the Guru, knowing that Guru Hitan, I'm acting for the benefit of the Guru, but actually he is my Hiteshi, he is my well-wisher. So with that intimate faith, one can accept a guru with the faith that he has served his guru, he has received his knowledge, he is self-controlled, he has nothing to gain, he's not interested in anything in this world, he is only living in this world, vasantava loka hitam charantaha, just shantamaha anto nevasanti santo, vasantava loka hitam charantaha, he's living peaceful, self-controlled, pleasing like the spring season and travels in this world, lives in this world simply for the benefit of others, then what? Swayam turnam bhavanavam No, turnam bhavanavam swayam he has uh, personally crossed over the ocean of material life and ahetuna nyanapi tariyantaha and causelessly, without any personal gain, <coughs> he lives in this world for the sake of delivering others. This, this shlok won't be very popular here in Udupi. 
not because of its content, but because it's composed by Sripad Shankar Acharya, <laughs> who is in Madhva Sampradaya considered an, an incarnation of the demon Maniman. <laughs> Although the Padma Purana states that he's an incarnation of Lord Shiva, so they say that, well, the partial incarnation, all the bad things he taught through the agency of the, the demon Maniman. Anyway, this shloka is very nice and can be applied to sadhus, devotees, who live in this world for uplifting others. That, that faith is there. We see here, Shukde, Kashapa, Brihaspati, they had disciples who lived with them, came to them voluntarily, and voluntarily accepted their discipline because they had firm faith that by whatever he asks, whatever he wants us to do, we shall do. And he shall give us that wealth which cannot be acquired by business practices, nor by even by independently performing austerities, nor by independently studying the Shastra. That wealth of... Actually, the highest wealth is that wealth of love of Krishna. So that can be imparted by one devotee to another. Bhaktiya Sanjat, you know, this uh, Bhakti is too Bhagavad Bhakta Sangena Parijayate. Bhakti is transmitted from devotee to devotee. So these persons mentioned here, they're all devotees. They had different functions within this world. Here, Shukdev Goswami has described there are various points about Shukdev Goswami which are not mentioned in. Srimad Bhagavatam. There's mysterious or the mystery of Shukadeva Goswami that one aspect of him was he is also living in this world with disciples, unlike the description of Shukadeva Goswami given in this first canto of Bhagavatam who left he didn't even want to come out of the womb but he eventually came out and left home immediately I don't want to get involved in this Maya then he came back only to hear Srimad Bhagavatam then Kashap he's famous as the father of Vamanade. He's also the any other famous children of Kashyap you can think of. How about Hiranyakashipu? He's the partial brother of Bamande. <laughs> and so many others. All the species, all the different species. Sarama is given as name of one of his wives, from which the word Sharameya comes, which is one of the Sanskrit names. Sounds very nice, doesn't it? It means a dog. <laughs> so, he gave birth to so many different species. Brihaspati, great devotee, eventually, by the grace of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he eventually, he eventually got that knowledge, that highest knowledge of all, the apex of all Shastric knowledge by which one will dance like a child in front of Lord Jagannath in Rathiyatra. This knowledge, Savabhom Bhattacharya acquired. So this Vedic knowledge, the extent is unlimited. We cannot, we cannot imagine. Here at Udupi is the one of the great seats of Vedic knowledge has been for many centuries and 
even though other seeds of Vedic learning have declined, this culture has been maintained here. Still in India, there are places of actual culture. This is one of them. We have to see spiritual India. If one comes to India and says, I I saw Bombay, I saw Bangalore, I saw Delhi, I saw Taj Mahal, Ajanta Caves, you didn't see India. Even you go to Vrindavan and sit in the Lassi Bar, you didn't see. You have to come to these places and be with the people who are maintaining the culture, spend time, imbibe this culture. Srila Prabhupada said that uh, the Krishna Conscious Movement is not an ordinary religious movement. It's, it's a spiritual, cultural, philosophical, educational movement for this re-spiritualization of the entire world. So this high culture that was here, in India. Now, India was known for that. <coughs> the Westerners, they thought these Indian people are stupid because although a few people are living very magnificently, the, the Rajas and some merchants, they were so wealthy. But the ordinary people, they don't care. They're just living in some mud houses. and So they thought the people are stupid. There's so much natural wealth here. Why don't they develop? So the British came and they developed the economy. They made trains and mines. And being bedazzled by the prospects of economic development, the first Prime Minister of Independent India declared that the temples of modern India will be the factories. Rascal. How he spoiled this country. But the people in general, they didn't. They already had their temples. They won those temples. Because they understood. They were hearing from sadhus. They had a higher wealth. They understood what is kim sukham martya dham. You know, what, is the, what happiness is here in this world? What is the use of being a rich man? It's just more anxiety. Let us cultivate spiritual wealth. And the, even the ordinary people were so wealthy that their wealthy means not in terms of money. Actually, even that, they were more wealthy than people today because even the, even the poor people, they would have so much jewelry, which nowadays they don't have. They just have plastic bags. Men would also have jewelry and women more. Now, now they, have, they have a little gold bracelet and that's all. But so much jewelry they would have. So even in material, to, in, they had more, but their wealth was this cultivation of spiritual knowledge. So that even most people didn't know how to read or write, but they all knew all the leelas of Ram, all the stories of Mahabharata, all the stories of Krishna. They knew this. And this was their breathing. This was their living. This was... It was not an unusual thing. It was a very common thing. Previously in India, that people, they spend their whole life just doing some activity, whether they're a shopkeeper or a farmer or a teacher or whatever. At the end of life, they retire and they just do bhajan. They just chant the holy names of the Lord and they'll just do that and live very well and die and like that, chanting the holy names of the Lord. It's very That was the cult. Everyone was doing it. Nowadays, they just sit and watch the TV. That's it. They forgot Krishna. How unfortunate. So at least in places like this, Udupi, there are still some places where there's an attempt to keep that culture alive, the, the Krishna-centered culture. And actually all of our ISKCON temples are meant to be for that, that everything is completely centered on Krishna, that everything we do we do to remember Krishna. Every act we do, every everything we say, it's all centered on Krishna. So we can imagine how vibrant this place was previously when people 
they didn't just visit as a kind of curiosity to see the deity, but they'd every day be hearing about Krishna, and then they'd walk to come here, many miles over many days, and just thinking, when will we have darshan of the Lord? And walking, walking, singing as they're going along, sing different bhajans of the Lord, and then arrive, and, and they'd be so happy to see the the swamis who are all the time engaged in the service of the Lord and fall down in his way. They're just being complete ecstasy. Nowadays it's nice, people come by bus or by train like me and just come in and come out. But that concentration where the only thought is how we can and have darshan of the Lord, this same Lord we, we heard so much about, now we're going to have darshan of this same Lord who who came from Dwarka to be worshipped by Madhvacharya and his descendants. He was being worshipped by Devaki. And you all know, you must have heard that when you came here, no? How he came in the ship and Madhvacharya, he was just walking on the beach and the ship is in trouble. He directed to the shore. So you take some of our cargo as a gift. I'll take some of the stones the ballast which is kept for keeping the ship even. You know, this is very strange. What does he want that for? We're going to give him some goods that we're carrying and he wants some stone some which is used as the ballast. But that stone, it's that was Gopichanda. And within that stone was the source of all stone in the universe and everything else in the universe appearing in the form of a stone but those whose eyes and hearts are not made of stone can understand that potima nahe to me, sakshat vrajendranandan. This is not stone, this is directly Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So Madhvacharya brought him on his head, reciting prayers as he came, and established him here. And since that time the worship has been going on by the Swamis, all very holy persons. The system here is Bal Sanyas. They'll give sannyas in childhood. So they, they never had any involvement with material affairs. Just they're trained from childhood that our life is meant for worshipping Krishna. And that's all they do, all they learn is Swamis. And they take in turns, Pariyai, to, to worship the Lord. And during the two years of their Pariyai, They'll just be there in the temple. They have their own mat at the side, but then from early morning to night, the Swami himself, the, he does all the pujas and aratis and all, everything. So, like this, the, the, the culture is being maintained. That same Shukdev, Rihaspati, all these great personalities, that this culture attracted great persons to come and be present here just like a fish swims in the water so within the within the spiritual culture naturally people will come if that spiritual culture is there then naturally people will come who can operate within that culture it's more difficult to live and act as a sannyasi in the western countries where people have no idea what it means to be a sannyasi here in India, one can live as a sannyasi to some extent, even now. People have some idea what it means to be a sannyasi, and they, re they interact accordingly. So if this culture is there of Krishna-centered culture, then definitely so many great persons will take birth in this culture, just like Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sahasra talked he took, he appeared in this world in the house of Srila Bhakti and Uttaka. Of course, Prahlad also appeared to Hiranyakashipu, but that's unusual. Generally, those families where there's very high spiritual culture, then they will attract similar persons to take birth. So, coming to these places, we can we can learn, we can try to imbibe what is that culture, not think that 
we coming from the western countries we know better see all the bad things oh what's this dirt here don't see the dirt see krishna krishna is here devotees are here try to enter into that so hari krishna is there any question about this you can bring up those things Any question? Ah, oh, please. Tell us more about Vaishnav behavior. Well, it's a big subject. You have to become a disciple. <laughs> That means it, it means it may take some years. Not everything. It's we're not going to bring out the book. Learn Vaishnav culture in 21 days. Something like teach yourself. Vaishnav culture for dummies or something like that. It's not for dummies. It's for highly elevated people. Anyway, at some point in time, I t intend to bring out a book about that. I, I wrote the book years ago and I, I didn't finish it because I thought I'd just finish this book on Bhaktis Dhansa Sri Thakur first. And that's been going on for the last few years because all these subjects are unlimited. But better even than I can write a book and you can read it, but better you come and spend some time here. Spend some time here with cultured people, then you can pick up the culture. Imbibe that. That's complete training. And one has to understand what is the proper culture and what isn't also. It's, it's subtle. It's very subtle, like anything, like anything high or advanced. It's not just you can read a book and then that's it, you learn it. But it's it's subtle to understand all these points. I did write one book which gives some idea of that, that glimpses of traditional Indian life. I don't know if you saw that. That will give some idea. Any other question? I mean, it's... It's too big a question to, to answer at the end of a class. It could be the subject of many classes. Hmm. Yeah. What's the question? Very often in India, yeah? You mean for women to sing and dance in public? Is that the question? That's the question. Um, generally, it's it's considered not very respectable in India or in actually in any country. It's previously it wasn't considered very. It was considered that high class women wouldn't do it wouldn't sing and dance in public in any country of the world. Hmm? Yeah. yeah. The, for the carnival, yeah. yeah. Well, we're talking about high culture here. So, because it's understood that... Um, Whatever the feelings may be of the women, there will be men who like to see that in another way, in a materially lusty way. 
So just like Jagat Maharaj was saying that in Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's Sankirtan, there's a description of seven Sankirtan groups, but they're all men. So traditionally, in India, the women, they, they do their dancing, they do it separately. They have their own satsangs, and no men are allowed there. And then they sing and dance whatever they like, as much as they like, for the pleasure of Krishna. That's the tradition. And if it's, if it's done otherwise, of course, when we, we're talking in a very broad way here, in a broad manner, among Bengalis, women they have more, at least from what I've seen, they have more freedom of expression like that. But, but uh, definitely jumping around vigorously in public would not be considered very respectable. And it might work against our preaching, actually, if you do that, because then people, they can't relate to it and they consider it low class or like that. So I would suggest that, especially in India, that you you have your own kirtan party, is it, ladies? They have? Sometimes. Sometimes. And I would suggest that you uh, keep it a little, keep the outward expression somewhat reserved. <laughs> I would think especially in Udupi, which is such a traditional place, very conservative here, perhaps more than any other, I think more than any other Vaishnav center in India, this is the most conservative. For men it's fine to go like this. If you have a shirt, they'll think it's better not to have a shirt. But for women there's different rules. That's the been set up since the time of Lord Brahma. <coughs> Anything else? Yeah. The teachings of Madhva Acharya. That's it. Dvait. Shuddha Dvaitavad, emphasizing the diff in opposition to the Kevala Dvaitavad of Shankaracharya, he emphasized that everything is not all one, there is two-ness, there is difference. The Jeeva and Ishvara are not the same, there is difference. There is difference between Ishvara and Jiva. Difference between Jiva and Jiva is difference between Jiva and Jara, the material. So he emphasized in, in so many ways the difference that the, the Jiva is different from and subordinate to the Supreme Lord, who is Krishna. That's it in a nutshell. If you want to learn it, you have to get born in, a, in detail. Then you have to get born in a Madhva Brahmin family. Then you can join them in the, in the Gurukul over there and get trained. It's beyond most of our powers of comprehension. It's very complex. You have to learn Sanskrit first of all. The main book, they, well, of course, this is great center of Srimad Bhagavatam learning. But for argumentation, they study Nyaya Sudha, which is a, a book of logic by which they refute all the points of the Mayavadis. But actually for day-to-day -day preaching, and the, they, they argue with the, here in Karnataka also, there's the Sringeri Mat, or the, the place of one of the four Mats established by Shankaracharya. That's the place of Rishya Sringa. So they sometimes 
come together. They, up there, they also they have very strong culture and they speak Sanskrit. So many people here speak Sanskrit, and they study the shastra and they they meet and they argue. These the pundits from here and the pundits from there, but it's only between themselves. It doesn't have much practical application to the world today. All the details of how they of how they discuss. Some years ago, there was um, adjoining here this district, the Dakshin Canada district is Kurg district. So where there's many people who are Kshatriya by caste there. So they're meat eaters. So one of them came to the one of these landowners or coffee estate owners came to see one of the swamis here, I think it was must maybe this Pajawa Mat Swami, and said that now I I want to be a devotee of Krishna, I want to be a vegetarian, and what can I do? I'm born in Kshatriya caste, what should I do? Now, you please give me some guidance. He said, you better go to Wisconsin. we don't know what to do with you. <laughs> they're, they're rigidly set in their ways, very conservative. So, I don't, maybe they've opened up now, because they're, they're realizing that the threat of conversions to Christianity and so this Pejava Swami, Vishveshwar Tirtha Swami, he's very active all over India and with the idea that we should open up Hinduism to embrace all the lower castes. Of course, they don't have the kind of money that the Christians have. To, they convert people by offering them uh, free chicken on Sunday, not as a pet. Come to church and get a chicken as you go out. Chickens growing here also. So they make, and then they, they make schools for their children. So in this way, by money power, the, the Christians are converting left, right, and center all over India. In Malaysia also, they're working hard. They, they, they're bankrupt in the West. So they're coming to India and Africa where people are still somewhat pious. They make more converts here. So, at least the, at least Pajawa Swami here, who's the most famous and respected, he's very active in this. He also said a few years ago in Bangalore, in a public meeting, that ISKCON is the only society capable of preaching Vishnu Bhakti all over the world. <laughs> Hmm. I can't hear anything you're saying, and I don't know lip reading, so. I didn't hear. What is it? How can one cultivate humility? It's one of those how to questions. Well, what are you proud about? Whatever you're proud about, it's nothing to be proud of. <laughs> we have no reason to be anything but... Our lack of humility is only our foolishness. We have nothing to be... We have, none of us have anything to be proud about. So it's just a matter of understanding. I've, I'm completely insignificant. There's, there's no logic in pride. It's just <laughs> foolishness, that's all. <laughs> yes, sir, he visited the birthplace of Madhva Chari. Huh? There were many pictures of Madhva Chari, and under him was like a picture of Krishna. And under picture of Rama. So did he teach that Rama 
the pictures had been pl of Krishna and Rama had been placed underneath Madhvacharya. Did he teach like that? I doubt it very much. And that's not proper. He himself would always pl he placed Krishna on his head when he brought him here. That's the normal thing. Of course, that must be that Krishna is on top always. <coughs> All right, one more question. What's that, a horse? Of what? The horse is eating from something. Somebody is holding this thing and the horse is eating from this. Oh. Yeah, that's not Madhvacharya. That's, who is that? Bharada. Bharada Rajatita. Hayagriva is worshipped in South India for the, the form of the Lord to be worshipped for attaining spiritual knowledge. So we'll finish there. Hare Krishna. And I made a clap. It wasn't meant for entertainment. Hare Krishna. You have some announcement? I have some announcement too. Being shameless, I record my lectures and there are recordings of them here if anyone would like to take. Hare Krishna. And there's a few books of mine. This is also available if anyone would like to take. <coughs>